Then, uh, Todd, I'd like you to introduce yourself and introduce what you're going to tell us today. Thank you. Todd Wilson. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Todd Wilson, and um, I'm you know, thrilled to be here and talking about um, Pittsburgh's bridges. Um, in, 20, in late 2015, um, Helen Wilson and I, and Helen, if you would stand, um, Helen is the vice president of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society. Hi, and I, we corresponded and collaborated to create this book, um, Pittsburgh's Bridges, the same series as uh, Dr. Euler's book on Bridgeville's history. <coughs> so, I'm going to talk to you about the history of Pittsburgh's Bridges, which, now, if I would cover everything in this book, would probably be here about four or five hours. So, I'm sure we have better things to do. So. I'm only going to focus on the bridges in and around this point. So we know of Pittsburgh being the city of bridges. Now, of course, Pittsburgh might uh, be a little bit jealous of Bridgeville because Bridgeville might be a better name for Pittsburgh, right? But uh, what, so certainly the city is defined by the bridges, but what made Pittsburgh become the city of bridges? Well, let's go back in time. Certainly before modern human development, there were no bridges. When did Pittsburgh get its first bridge? Well, in the late 18, or sorry, late 1650s, I mean, sorry. Yeah, in the late 1650s um, and 60s, sorry, 17, sorry. In the late 1750s and 60s, Fort Pitt was constructed. And if we zoom into Fort Pitt, we can see bridges going essentially into the fort. So when Pittsburgh transitioned from being the forks of the Ohio to Fort Pitt, which later became Pittsburgh, bridges became part of the city's built history. So when you think Pittsburgh, you can always think of there being some sort of bridge. So here's an image of the city from 1817, that was first incorporated as a city in 1860. In this view, you can see there are no bridges. That would happen soon after. In 1818, the first river bridge was built over the Monongahela River at Smithfield Street. And this was a wooden covered toll bridge. Why was it built at Smithfield Street? Well, Here's the city of Pittsburgh. It might be hard to read, but you can see Smithfield Street was still identified on the old map. And it connected to the only road that went up to the top of, today we know it as Mount Washington or Cold Hill back then. So this was the only opportunity for connectivity from downtown Pittsburgh to the top of Mount Washington. That's why the Smithfield Street Bridge was built here. Today, this part of the road has been realigned it still exists, but it's abandoned. So Sycamore Street today connects somewhere else. So that's why the bridge today seems like it ends at a T intersection. Over to the Allegheny River, the first toll bridge was built in the next year, 1819. And this was at St. Clair Street, which is 6th Street today. And this was another wooden covered bridge. And it was built to go from what we know as downtown Pittsburgh today to be part of the public square on the old map, the part of Allegheny City. Now these bridges were private. Initially, the government was only involved in such that they would help fund the companies that would be chartered to build a bridge. If business interests thought, hey, we can make money by upgrading the ferry to the bridge, they would gather investors and build to fund a bridge, build a bridge, and pay off their investors with toll revenue and run the company that way. So the government would only be part of the investment team. But by the 1840s, that pretty much ended, and bridges at that time were entirely privately funded. So very different to most bridges today. This is the old 7th Street Bridge, and you can see the toll house and the toll collectors. Now, Pittsburgh, we, we know of Pittsburgh as being the gateway to the West, but that status, believe it or not, was in doubt in the early 1800s. Pittsburgh was the natural location, the forks of the Ohio, at the beginning of the Ohio River. However, once engineers started building new ways of 
traveling into America's frontier, Pittsburgh became bypassed. The Erie Canal was completed in 1825, creating a water route into the frontier. The National Road, which was constructed from 1811 to 1818 to Wheeling along the Ohio River, bypassed Pittsburgh to the south as a wagon route. So now Pittsburgh was out of the way. City leaders realized this and campaigned the legislator to um, construct a canal across the state. And that was, um, in that way, Pittsburgh would now be on the new transportation route. As part of this canal, it required an aqueduct. So after those first two wagon bridges were built in the city, the next <laughs> bridge was an aqueduct. So just imagine that. Um, the canal was uh, constructed between 1826 and 1834, and this bridge was built in 1829. It was a wooden covered bridge. This is what it would look like below the wooden covering, and here's an image, a section with the canal barge inside a trough on the bridge. Um, and the reason this bridge was built was the surveyors determined, thank you, the, the surveyors determined that on the north side, the Allegheny side, would be the preferable route to run the canal. The canal went along the Allegheny River to the Kiskiminitis River, Panama through Johnstown. So at that time, Allegheny City was a separate city. So the business leaders of Pittsburgh were pretty upset. We advocated to get this beautiful canal, and it's built to our rival city of Allegheny and not to Pittsburgh. So the compromise was to build an aqueduct across the river around 11th Street, around where the Fort Wayne Railroad Bridge is today, and come into the city. And the canal had a tunnel where it's below where the steel building is today, and, and emptied at the Monongahela River near where that railroad bridge is today. However, if you think that there could be issues with a wooden covered canal aqueduct over a river, you are correct. The, Aqueduct had frequent maintenance problems. There were times where it would spring a leak. There were even like a case or two where the entire contents of the water drained back into the river. So the canal company knew that they needed to replace this bridge. Now, along comes John Roebling. He was born in Germany, um, emigrated to, to Saxonburg, Butler County in 1831. Uh, when he was in Germany, he um, was involved with the military and saw suspension bridge construction and became fascinated by it. Um, one of the first suspension bridges, by the way, was, in, it was built in 1801 at the border of Westmoreland and Fayette County. And, so, and that was, is, is considered to be the first modern suspension bridge. So it's interesting to think of suspension bridge as a Western Pennsylvania product as the technology developed here, but it also developed then in New York as information was shared. So here you have Roebling, who learned about suspension bridge technology in the 1820s, came to America, and in 1837, he was hired by this Pennsylvania Canal. And um, one of the, you know, one thing about the canal, think about how would you connect, get a canal to run through the Allegheny Mountains? Water doesn't flow uphill. There's a limit to how high locks can be. Their solution was, between Johnstown and Hollidaysburg, just south of Altoona, their solution was to, to offload the cargo onto a railroad. Initially, it was a pre-locomotive railroad where the rail cars were drawn by mules or horses, though later um, <coughs> locomotives were used on this railroad. So as far as the mountains, there were inclines, just like the ones here in Pittsburgh. Imagine an incline, a mile or two long, going up the side of one of the mountains in Pennsylvania. Here's an image of an in, of the incline house and pulling um, a canal sectional barge up um, maybe Allegheny Mountain or one of the mountains in that area. Instead of modern cables to pull these you know, the barges or cars up and down the mountains, they used hemp ropes, which did not have that long of a lifespan, 16 months maybe. And occasionally these hemp ropes would snap 
while they were in use. So cargo is being pulled up, the rope might snap, and especially initially, everything would run back down the mountain and have quite a catastrophe. Now, Roebling, <coughs> for Roebling, that was an opportunity. He perfected a method of twisting strands of iron into rope and advocated to the canal to use his new wire rope to replace the hemp cables. And that's how he helped, um, helped advance his career in wire rope technology. But what Roebling really wanted to do was design a bridge. As he said, um, the study of suspension bridges formed for the last few years my residence in Europe, my favorite occupation. So with all of the problems with the Allegheny Aqueduct, he was able to convince the canal company to let him design a suspension bridge using his new wire rope. So here's a drawing of that bridge. This is a similar Roebling bridge from 1848, which still exists and crosses the Delaware River, the other side of the state. And this, so this was the Roebling's very first suspension bridge. Does anyone know which one was his last? Brooklyn Bridge, that's correct. So he got his start here in Pittsburgh. And just as an aside, um, one of my friends found a map of New York City today. And for Brooklyn Bridge, it was a picture of a Pittsburgh Bridge. So, so there's certainly a, still a connection. But, so, so that bridge was completed in 1845. What, what else happened in 1845? A large portion of the city caught on fire, including the wooden covered Smithfield Street Bridge. All that survived after the fire were the bridge piers. A private company wanted a bridge to be built as quickly and cheaply as possible to resume service across the bridge. Roebling, finishing the aqueduct, was in the right place at the right time. So, so he was hired to design a suspension bridge, you can see the suspension bridge here, to be fitted on the top of the surviving bridge piers. By the way, um, let's see, I think it's in this picture. You can see the Monongahela, this is a later picture, and you can see the Monongahela incline right there. Why was, why was it built there? Because it had connectivity to the old Roebling suspension bridge. So after this bridge was completed, Roebling was really getting his bridge career started, and he wanted to build, he proposed, this bridge at the point. So this is the north side, so Heinz Field would be over here. Here's the point about where the fountain would be in Mount Washington to give you a frame of reference. So just imagine a structure like this would have been completed. However, if you think it was difficult for a private company to get enough money to build one bridge, imagine how much it would cost to have enough money to build three bridges. Meanwhile, the shipping industry did not like this idea because this bridge could potentially walk all three rivers from larger boats, larger commercial trip. So this design was never built. Um, in 1871, his son, Washington Roebling, again advocated for this bridge to be built. Again, that did not happen. And instead, the cheaper solution of two private bridges were built at the point um, which we'll talk about in this presentation later. The, so Roblin built one more bridge in the city of Pittsburgh, and this was in 1859, <coughs> and this was to replace the first Sixth Street Bridge. So you can see both of the original wooden covered bridges in Pittsburgh were replaced by Roblin suspension bridges. The owner of this company believed that in 1839 the Ninth Street Bridge was built, so now there were two crossings over the Allegheny. The owner believed, well, if we build a nicer bridge, a more, a more beautiful bridge here at 6th Street, people will pay to cross our bridge rather than that other covered bridge. So imagine thinking about bridge companies as competing with each other in terms of design and beauty. But that's what happened, and there was quite a noticeable spike in revenue when this beautiful new um, suspension bridge was built. You can see the by the coal house here. So next we'll talk about the beginning of the railroad bridges in the city. Um, you, 
the uh, first railroad across the state was completed in 1854, 1852, completed locally, going from downtown Pittsburgh to Philadelphia to compete with the canal. A lot of the, not all, but a lot of the railroad line was built next to the canal. Well, a railroad was a cheaper, more reliable route. It didn't freeze over in the winter, didn't have the troublesome connection between Johnstown and Holidaysburg. So the railroad really quickly put the canal out of business. And so by, which happened by 1857. And at that time, they were able to complete and open a bridge across the Allegheny River next to the old aqueduct and connect their lines to Ohio. Um, that first wooden bridge, I couldn't find any images of it, was replaced not long after 1864 with this iron lattice girder. This is a very European bridge style. Um, there are very few, if any, bridges that were ever built like this in America. But if you go to York, you'll see bridges like this still today. The next type of bridge we want to talk about are the, street, the old streetcar bridges. What was really interesting about the streetcars was for the first time, the city could develop away from you know, the, you know, the convenient river banks, the convenient valleys. Um, railroads, you know, long distance railroads could only be built in certain locations. So the streetcars allowed the city to develop in different directions. South Hill was certainly um, an area that was able to be penetrated by streetcars and developed by streetcars. And this is the old Palm Garden Bridge here. In 1886, the electric trolley was invented, which helped streetcars navigate up and down grades. And with streetcars for the first time, you're, you're building new bridges over ravines and taller bridges. You know, wagons can afford streams. Streetcars obviously can't afford streams. So a lot of the a lot of our bridges today over the valleys started out as streetcar bridges. So when did the government begin to get involved in bridges? And well, in the late 1800s, it's really when the government agencies began to be formed. 1887 is when the city's public works department was formed. And this, the city of Pittsburgh used to originally just be downtown. And every, essentially every city neighborhood was its own municipality. The city grew through annexation, through taking over these various municipalities. And that, as the city grew larger, it helped um, create the need for a larger public works department. And now you have the case where once the city would, say for example, Pittsburgh in the south side, which was Birmingham, once Birmingham became part of the city of Pittsburgh, now you have private toll bridges between, from one part of the city to another part of the city. And that is why residents complained, well now we're part of the city, why can't we travel freely through our new city? Is the, is a large part of the reason why the public wanted the government to begin to buy and take over bridges. So the city's first major bridge was the Brady Street Bridge um, from 1896 to connect the new annexed south side to the city of Pittsburgh. As the development grew, the Allegheny County Public Works Department was formed in 1895, and the county began to build roads connecting like town to town, municipality to municipality. And they began to get into the bridge building business in 1910 when the Halton Bridge was completed. As development continued to grow and as the city stopped annexing areas, most of the major bridges became now county-owned bridges. In 1924, the county's ultimate highway system um, legislation went through where a lot of the Grand Boulevards and a lot of the major bridges that we see today were built as part of this um, ultimate highway system. The State uh, Department of Highways was formed in 1903, and um, state highways started to be designated in 1911, and um, today uh, the Department of Highways is now the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation or PennDOT. Today the state owns most of the major bridges. And the state's first major bridge in Pittsburgh, it was the Fort Pitt Bridge from um, 1959. Now, the last piece I want to mention about 
government, before we get into some of the bridges themselves, is the city's municipal arts commission. As the city was developing very quickly in the late 1800s and early 1900s, little care was given to any sort of civic beauty. It's, Pittsburgh was an industrial city, and maybe you know, a company wanted to have a beautiful building, but there was no uniform approach to city beautification. City's parks weren't even, land wasn't even purchased from the city's first parks until 1889. So this is kind of the period where the city's saying, we want to be a big city, we want to be a beautiful city. So through the advocation of John Betty of the Carnegie Museum, this municipal art commission was formed in 1911 with the intent that they would um, provide, you know, recommend artistic embellishments for structures, and they would have veto power. If they didn't like a structure built with civic funds, they could say, no, you cannot build this until you uh, add you know, something more artistic to the structure. The commission still exists, and there was a case of the Hotel Indigo in East Liberty recently, where they could not open their doors until they put some art along the side of the building that uh, they were resisting. So, anyway, so, so originally, some of these first bridges, you can see just these beautiful embellishments on the structures. But what ended up happening was this commission was started at the time the, when the Manchester Bridge was built, and they did not like the design of the Manchester and I'll show some pictures of that coming up. So beyond that, this commission evolved where they began to view the structural design of the bridge itself, not the embellishments, but the design as contributing to the bridge's artistic merit. Because of this commission, and I'll go into this more, Pittsburgh has very beautifully designed bridges, more so than the other places in the county and, of course, many other cities. So with that, um, just cover a few of the downtown bridges. Here's a view from 1969 with Three River Stadium under construction, and the second and third generation point bridges. The first bridge at the point was the last covered bridge built in the city of Pittsburgh, the Union Bridge. And it was constructed in 1875, so four years after the plans to revive the, the three-part bridge at this point fell through. And as a covered bridge, it was built rather cheaply, and it was also low to the water. Land at the point is low to the water. As a result, this bridge became a, an, an obstruction to navigation. Take a look at this uh, image during a flood, where you know, the, the high water comes almost to the end, you know, the bottom of the bridge. This bridge became so tri And also, look at how many different piers there were in the river. This bridge became such an obstruction to navigation that the business interests petitioned the War Department to get rid of it. And finally, in 1889, a Rivers and Harbors Act was passed, giving the War Department that power. So on the grounds of it being an obstruction to navigation, the government was able to have a private company <laughs> remove their bridge, which happened in 1907. The uh, Point Bridge over the Monongahela was opened two years later in 1877. Now, the Monongahela River had a slower current and had earlier privately built commercial locks and dams. So this bridge was not able to, so, so the river interest put up more of a fight to make sure that this bridge would not obstruct navigation the way that the Point Bridge did. So it was a very challenging bridge to build an 800 foot main span with this novel design where the eye bars were stiffened. So you have a slender suspension bridge deck and these, the, the design was to stiffen in the eye bar catenaries to make the bridge more rigid so it wouldn't bend in the wind. If you're familiar with the Gallopy Gertie Bridge, which you know, collapsed because of how much it would you know, twist it in the wind. But see just how you know, interesting and beautiful this, uh, this bridge was. Um, it was deteriorated, closed to traffic in 1924, demolished in 1927 once the new bridge was built. And here's what the point looked like in 1894 with its original bridges. 
certainly a different site than today. Once the, um, the Union Bridge was demolished, it was replaced by the Manchester Bridge, which was built from 1911 to 1915. The bridge was built to accommodate navigation with larger spans. And if you look at construction, one side was built, so navigation um, was still permitted, and then the other side was built. Um, one interesting thing about this bridge, and this kind of shows the result of the Art Commission, is the top of the bridge, instead of, see how this diagonal part right here is a little thicker? That's really the end of the structure. The top of the bridge was extended to end vertically. The reason being was the bridge was supposed to have these ornate um, you know, Gothic style portals with these flying buttresses over the, these pedestrian walkways. That was deemed too expensive, so instead, public art was designed to be on the vertical portal. So this is the uh, um, showing uh, Guy Asuna and Christopher Gist meeting. And these portals, art still exists. And Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation worked with the Steelers. And now, um, you know, this art is uh, on display right outside of Heinz Field. And other decorations for the bridge still exist today on our display at the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Housing Resource Center in Wilkinsburg. You see some shields on the bridge. When it was time to replace the bridge over the Monongahela, the Point Bridge, the Art Commission wanted a design that was complementary to make the point look more symmetrical. The problem was the river interest wouldn't allow a, a pier in the center of the river like the Manchester Bridge. So how do you build a bridge that looks like the Manchester Bridge, but add a different design? The engineers felt the traditional cantilever bridge would be the ideal solution. However, those designs don't really match. So they had to come up with something that the Art Commission would approve. So they looked at the example of, so imagine this bridge flipped upside down. So there's a cantilever bridge where the road deck would go across the top of the bridge, like the Liberty Bridge. What the engineers did was they took this design, instead of putting the road on top, hung the road below. And you can see this is that similar looking design with the road hung below. So this was a very unusual novel design of the um, 1927 um, Point Bridge over the Nongahela. And one of the nice features of this design is that you had a more open road deck where when you drive across the bridge, more able, you know, you're better able to see the city than you would with a traditional truss bridge. So that was one of the goals of the Art Commission. After, that, after the Manchester Bridge, every bridge built, every river bridge built in Pittsburgh was done so with somewhat of an open bridge deck. Meanwhile, as soon as you cross the city line into the county, like the old Swickley Bridge, or the Ambridge Bridge, or the Keysport McCain Bridge, New Kensington Bridge, Halton Bridge, anywhere you'd go, you'd go back to a traditional truss bridge. So that's why the bridges of the city were unique. They had somewhat of an open bridge deck. And um, it's important to note that George S. Richardson was the engineer in charge of this bridge. Um, he, became, he was responsible for a lot of the city of Pittsburgh bridges that we know and love today beginning with the Point Bridge and ending with the Swinton Bridge. So, and this view here of this portal shot, uh, taken by George S. Richardson himself, shows the change in what the Art Commission was advocating. Gone is the ornamentation that you see on the Manchester Bridge. Instead, this bridge's structure was its art. Also, I want to point out in this image of the point, this is the abutment here of the old Union Bridge. That shows you just how low that bridge was to the river. Here's the point in 1947 with the uh, second generation bridges. And now we'll talk about this proposal for another bridge over the rivers at the point, one designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. After World War II, the city was looking at ways of reinventing itself. I mean, business leaders knew that they weren't going to be a steel town forever. And they needed to modernize. And J. Edgar Kaufman commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to design the Civic Center 
with this thousand foot taller, sorry, thousand foot tall tower and cable state arms over both one arm over the Monongahela and one arm over the Allegheny. So you know, we're known internationally with falling water. Imagine if such a civic center bridge was built here in Pittsburgh. Of course, imagine how much it would cost. <laughs> Needless to say, this um, design was not approved and was not built. Um, and in looking on ways to redevelop the point, and the land was low, swampy, flooded frequently, it was not a good place to build. Um, the city wanted to go in the direction of, of building a park there and building two new bridges that were farther back. So these are the initial, initial designs to notice truss bridges, not the arch bridges that we see, and notice these complicated ramps into the point. Now these bridges were originally designed for streetcars. Once it was decided that they did not have to accommodate streetcars, the design was changed to double-deck bridges that would eliminate these intrusive looping ramps so the Fort Pitt Bridge, designed by uh, George S. Richardson, formed his, uh, formed his own company, Richardson Gordon Associates, um, designed by them, and was one of the first bridges built in the country that used computer-assisted calculations. When the bridge opened, um, Governor David Lawrence, former mayor, said, this bridge has a special importance as a testimonial to the rejuvenation of the city, as this bridge, Point State Park, central to Pittsburgh's first renaissance. In 1969, many years later, the, the Fort Duquesne Bridge finally opened. A lot of the bridge was built at the same time. This is, it was designed to match the Fort Pitt Bridge and give symmetry to the point. However, construction stopped on this bridge because of issues with connecting ramps on the north side. So, some of you may remember this, but for eight years, this is what the bridge looked like, the bridge to nowhere. And, and what's interesting, with the bridge that, with the connectivity not being completed until 1986, is the different building styles in the bridge itself. On the downtown side, all of the beams were straight. So to make a curving ramp, look at how you have beams here, here, Beams attached to other beams, you know, very complicated. But when you're limited to straight beams, that's what you have to do. In the 1960s, when the approaches opened, there these welded curving box girders. And meanwhile, in 1986, when the North Shore Expressway was completed, the concrete beams. So it's interesting to see this evolution of technology in just one bridge. Next, we'll go over just a few Allegheny River bridges. This is the old 6th Street Bridge and the old 7th Street Bridge. This, was, this bridge later became the Coriopolis Bridge, if you remember it there. So the third 6th Street Bridge was built in 1893. The Roblin Suspension Bridge could not support the electric streetcars. A lot of bridges were replaced because of these new heavy electric streetcars. Originally, this bridge was going to be another suspension bridge. But the company wanted a truss bridge because it could be easily constructed around the old suspension bridge. We're used to bridges being closed, right? Now they have to work on this, this bridge is going to be closed for a while. Well, when it was a privately owned bridge and the company's depending on the revenue source, they would do anything to keep the bridge moving and to keep it open. So a lot of the new bridges were built inside, around, above the old bridges. So, so once they got started erecting the main truss on this bridge, it only took 95 days to build this bridge. The next bridge we have is at 7th Street. Um, this bridge was built when there was so much traffic on the 6th Street Bridge and the 9th Street Bridge that a private company thought, hey, we could profitably build another bridge here. This was a suspension bridge, or um, an inverted arch design, as Gustav Rundenthal liked to call it. Gustav Lindenthal's first major bridge was the Smithfield Street Bridge in 1883. With the success of that bridge, he was immediately hired to do another bridge. And then after this, he did the bridge of 30th Street, as well as, well as a few other bridges in the city. 
Lindenthal then went on to become the commissioner of New York City bridges, so bridges like the uh, Queensboro Bridge, the Manhattan Bridge, and the, the Hellgate Bridge, um, which was a railroad bridge, were some of his bridges. So you can see both with Roblin and with Lindenthal, Pittsburgh is where they got their start, and then moved to New York City and became some of the most well-known engineers in American history. A few images of the bridge, the uh, wagon traffic. And certainly not a design that really exists in America anymore. Next was the Ninth Street Bridge. This bridge was originally in a wooden covered bridge. You see the, the uh, wooden covered bridge here without its covering. Um, this bridge was the second wagon bridge over the Allegheny River from 1839. In 1889, it was purchased by a streetcar company that wanted to put electric trolleys on this bridge. Like, like the Sixth Street Bridge, they needed to replace the bridge to hold these heavier transit vehicles. So they began to build a truss, metal truss bridge around the covered bridge. So they removed the covering and went span by span building this truss bridge. So you can really see there how it was built around the old bridge. It was designed by Ferris Kaufman and Company, Ferris, um, a few years later, designed the Ferris wheel for the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. And that's what the bridge looked like when it was completed. Now, there were, I mentioned the Union Bridge needing to be replaced, being a navigational obstruction. There were a lot of controversies, too, about the 6th, 7th, and 9th Street bridges. River Interest wanted these bridges to be removed as well. However, the government said, these bridges aren't great, but they're okay. We are not going to declare them obstructions to navigation. Despite, they could be low to the river, and the see in this image, pier arrangement was such that it was very difficult to navigate around. This is not the only, but one of the reasons why the Allegheny River isn't as industrial of a river as the Monongahela, because it was so difficult to get around the bridges downtown. So, in, as interestingly, in, um, first of all, in 1911 is when the city's annexation of Allegheny was completed, where Allegheny is now the north side. Now that the city owned land on both sides of the river, and now that the government said, no, these bridges do not need to be replaced, the city bought them and made them publicly owned free bridges. Well, things changed again in the build-up to World War I. So in 1917, now the War Department says, oh, these bridges are an obstruction. Navigation on these rivers is essential. So now the city was on the hook to replace the bridges. They had to have no center piers, a 400-foot main span, and park commission approval. Which one of those do you think really influenced their design? Certainly all of them, but art commission approval was quite a surprising challenge, and I'll get into that in a moment. First of all, the Sixth Street Bridge, because it was in pretty good shape, it was a relatively new bridge, instead of being demolished, was lowered onto barges and floated along the rivers to Coriopolis. So if you remember the old Coriopolis Bridge, which was demolished in 1995, that used to be downtown at Sixth Street. So, First, it was interesting. The engineers came up with, I just, I just love this, an engineering solution. Um, we don't think anything of steep grades on bridges today, but back in the era of horse-drawn vehicles, grades would present a problem. We want the bridge as flat as possible. Since they need to be higher above the river, the engineers came up with the idea, how about they're only taller when they need to be taller? They're only a few months of the year where the river levels are higher before the flood control um, that we have today. So let's build a design bridge that we can lift the bridge up for a few months of the year. Traffic would continue to drive across the bridges in a lifted configuration. This dashed line here represents 14 feet up, which is how high the main spans of the bridge could lift. I don't know of any bridges that you can drive across them when they're lifted. If you know, certainly let me know. It was a pretty unusual idea and one that had no public support. The big fear was, well, what if it breaks? Then we're back where we started, 
we can't get under the bridges. So they came up with these designs. So this is what the 6th, 7th, and 9th Street bridges were supposed to look like. And they designed the bridges, sent, you know, sent these plans to the Art Commission for their approval, and the Art Commission said no, and which was shocking at the time. The Art Commission, again, thought these bridges were be too obstructive. When you're on these bridges, you would not be able to see the city. They thought these designs were ugly. They didn't like that the 7th Street design didn't match. They told the Art Commission, we like the suspension bridges that were here before. We want suspension bridges. By then, there was a lot more development. It was very difficult to construct anchorages. The you know, conditions weren't right for good anchorages you know, for the foundations. So the engineers told the Art Commission, we can't build suspension bridges. And the Art Commissioner said, well, we want suspension bridges. So what to do? So the engineers looked for a European solution. This bridge was uh, completed in 1915 in Germany, which was one of the first self-anchored suspension bridges. Meaning rather than these catenaries anchored to the ground, they'd be anchored into the bridge itself. Does this bridge look slightly familiar? Given it was, demo it was um, demolished, I believe, in World War II. This bridge was the model for the Three Sisters. So they were built here as the first self-anchored suspension bridges in America. The most recent one is the East Bay Spans from the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. So this is a design that's still important today. So now that the bridge design was completed, creating how to build it was another problem. As I mentioned, the suspension cables were anchored into the bridge deck itself. That means the bridge deck had to be completed before the bridge would function. How do you build a bridge deck across the river without blocking navigation? The engineers came up with a very innovative solution where they built this bridge like a cantilever truss bridge, not a suspension bridge, a truss bridge. You see this plan with temporary struts and temporary truss to build this as this truss bridge. This is one of the reasons why the bridge is not a cable suspension bridge like the 10th Street Bridge or like most of the Golden Gate Bridge, like most suspension bridges. They didn't use wire rope, they used I bars because I bars to be connected like truss bridges. Here's an image of first they built the side spans, they built the anchors. This allowed them to build, you see the temporary trusses, to build each side of the bridge outward without blocking. Once the bridge was completed, then they were able to remove the temporary trusses, and then they would have suspension bridges. So here are the three sisters, which have won many awards. And you can see how if it wasn't for the art commission working with the engineers, that these would be very utilitarian bridges and wouldn't have the attention that they have today. Next, I want to move over to the uh, the replacement for the Fort Wayne Railroad Bridge. When it was built as a double deck rail bridge, though today only the top decks are still in use. When it was built, um, the uh, railroad was under pressure to make this bridge taller and give it a larger main span. It gave it the larger main span you see here, but it would not make the bridge any taller than the old bridge. Is it any, any more navigational clearance? Said all of the bridges on the one side, on the left are lower, all the bridges on the right are lower. Why should we build this bridge higher when no other bridge in the area is higher? Well, once in 1917 that the Three Sisters, as well as other bridges along the Allegheny, were declared obstructions, so was this bridge. So now the railroad had to raise the bridge by 13 feet. So this, this image shows them build, beginning to build the new abutments. So it just shows how high they had to raise the bridge. If you look at this image, you see a concrete pier caps showing you just how high they raised that bridge. They were able to do that without closing the bridge to rail traffic. They had jacks under each point. After a train would go by, all the jacks would raise the bridge by maybe a half inch. And then just you keep doing that after a period of several months. And eventually the bridge became high enough. So it's just pretty amazing to think about some of these engineering solutions. 
The last bridge I'll talk about on the Allegheny is the old uh, the 16th Street Bridge site. The original bridge was this wooden covered bridge, which um, had a lot of issues. It burned in 1851, was flooded in 1865. 1917, along with the other bridges, it, became, it was declared an obstruction to navigation. The company is still privately owned. The company wasn't sure what to do, and magically it just burned down in 1919. Problem solved. So the uh, city and county um, worked on the new bridge design. The art commission wanted not an engineering company to be the project manager of this new bridge, but an architecture firm to manage the bridge. So they commissioned Warren Wetmore, who is most famous for their association with Grand Central Station, to design this three-span tide arch bridge. And these armillary spheres at the portals were based off of this fountain in Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. You can see the armillary sphere and the winged horses. That fountain became you know, the ornamentation of the bridge. So if you're ever in Paris, please check out the Luxembourg Gardens and see that statue. There's also a row of turtles, but unfortunately the turtles didn't make it to the bridge. So if you wonder why is this bridge so beautiful, you can see why. That this is where the city, the art commission was in full force. This is the architecture design bridge. This is the 48th Street Bridge. And it's the portal showing just the uh, the artistic merit of the structure. Um, now we'll go over to the Monongahela River Bridge. It's the old point bridge there. And let's go back to the uh, Roebling Smithfield Street Bridge, the uh, suspension bridge here. That bridge also couldn't accommodate transit vehicles. And it was even difficult for it to um, accommodate before the electric streetcars, the horse pool streetcars. So in um, 1880, the company decided it was time to replace the bridge. With it. They were going to build a two-tower suspension bridge. They began work on the bridge. They began building the piers. They ordered the iron for the new bridge. Well, in um, 1881, the company was reorganized. The new owners bought the company because they thought we could make more money off of this bridge by not having it just for wagons and streetcars, but we could add rail to the bridge, too. The only problem was, you can't widen the suspension bridge. Therefore, they halted the progress of construction and redesigned the bridge. They hired immigrant Gustav Lindenthal. He had no formal education in York, which is why he came to America, because he wanted to be a bridge engineer, to design a new structure where he had to fit the structure onto the piers of the previous bridge, or the, or the, the design bridge. Lindenthal also specified steel. Even though the iron was already ordered, the iron was reused for the flooring of the bridge and the bridge approaches. So the bridge approaches used much more iron than any comparable bridge at the time because he wanted the main load-bearing members to be made of steel. This was the first major steel bridge in the area and one of, not the first in America, but one of them. Now, in replacing this bridge, like the other bridges, how do you build this new truss bridge without closing the old suspension bridge? And look at this picture of Central Street Bridge construction. You can kind of see here is the suspension bridge below the bridge. There's no OSHA to worry about back then. Can you imagine building a new bridge on top today? But the bridge went up, and this is how the Smithfield Street Bridge looked when it first opened. It's a beautiful Victorian portal design. And there's an image of the bridge with only the road lines. Now, when I mentioned that he wanted to widen, the, the bridge was designed so it could be widened, the uh, whole trusses were built on the uh, downstream end of the pier, so you can see the upstream end, stream end stick out. That was so they could build a rail line. It turned out it would be a transit line, and that was built in 1889. It became so well used that in 1904, the transit tunnel today, the, the T-tunnel, was constructed at the end of the bridge to open up the south hills for streetcars. That became so well used, it was only a single line, that in 1911, the bridge had to be widened again to 
be able to have two lines of streetcars on the uh, on the uh, street side, and you can see them widening the bridge. And at that time, those ugly, deteriorated, out of style portals were replaced with these new portals in 1915. The other bridge I'll mention over the Monongahela is the Liberty Bridge. This is the way the bridge looked originally, where the concrete pylons went all the way up above the bridge deck and had more decorative features. Um, the bottom part of this bridge is curved more so for, you know, or at least partially for, its artistic merit. If you compare this bridge with the Homes at High Level Bridge or the Rankin Bridge, you don't have these um, uniform arcs that you do on the uh, Liberty Bridge. But these are actually uh, cantilever trusses, 420 feet long. And this bridge was built to connect the Liberty Tunnels to open up the South Hills for vehicular traffic. And there's the bridge a few years after opening. See, it was certainly a traffic problem then, as um, it certainly is today. You can also see how the pylons went up above the bridge deck. And the bridge was um, designed by Allegheny County Department of Public Works. George S. Richardson was involved in this bridge design. And um, it was rehabilitated in 1983 when the bridge deck was widened and the concrete pylons were stripped. And again, in, you know, again, it's currently being rehabilitated. As, we, as some, certainly, it's been in the news lately with some of the uh, issues with rehabilitation, with the uh, bridge deck catching fire, as well as the uh, uneven road surface. So hopefully, that work will be well completed in um, 2017. I talked to an engineer who worked on the uh, 1983 rehabilitation and said that they replaced about 40% of the steel back then. Last, I'll cover just two Ohio River bridges in Rocks. First bridge over the Ohio is the West End Bridge, which was built in um, 1932. Up until, and the McKees Rocks Bridge, by the way, was built in just a year earlier. So before then, there were no vehicular crossings in Pittsburgh over the Ohio River. You had to drive and cross the point bridges. Um, that's part of the reason why the uh, areas around the Ohio didn't, like the Manchester Chateau side, West End, didn't develop as much as the South side, Lawrenceville. So there was a businessman, Henry Tranter, who advocated construction of this bridge to unite the West End and Manchester in prosperity. Unfortunately, this bridge was built, uh, was completed during the Great Depression, so that prosperity never emerged like he had intended. So this design, this tide arch design, was novel in a few ways. It was 240 feet longer than the Tacony Palmyra Bridge pictured here in the Philadelphia area. So by far, it was the largest bridge like it constructed at the time. It also, I'm going to go back for a second, you can see a lot of these older bridges had steel hangers. The McKees Rocks Bridge has steel hangers. The West End has wire rope hangers, pre-stressed wire rope hangers. So it's a novel use of that, as well as using high strand silicon steel with its to help um, it be such a large bridge with such a large span. Next bridge is the Ohio Connecting Railroad Bridge, the bridge over Bruno's Island. It's a bridge that you might not even notice, but it's one of the most fascinating in the city. Um, it was first built in 1890, so the, rail, so the trains bypass the city of Pittsburgh without going through. Um, being the Ohio River was particularly critical to navigation if you, because, because blocking the Ohio River would block the output of both the Monongahela and Allegheny River. To overcome that challenge, the main span was built off-site and floated into place in 1890s. So just imagine seeing that back then. 523 feet long, 65 feet tall, 75 feet above the river. One of the largest bridges built at the time, 4,500 feet long. It was only a single, only had a single track, so it quickly became overwhelmed with train traffic. The bridge needed to be replaced. It needed to be widened. 
but how do you keep trains going on the existing bridge while building a new bridge without blocking navigation? Floating in a new span would be difficult because you'd have to shut down the ground line. Is there another way to do it? And the answer was to build a pretty innovative solution where you would, the, the Brunos Island Bridge has a, crosses both the main channel of the Ohio River and the back channel of the Ohio River on the other side of the island. So they built, used the back channel part of the bridge, they built it, and I'll show pictures to explain this, but they used it next to the main channel span to provide anchorages to cantilever the main channel span. And so this is the main channel of the Ohio River. So they first built what would become the back channel span there's anchorages. There's an image where they started to construct the, these anchorages, these anchor spans. Keep in mind, this was built around the previous bridge because two tracks means that you need a wider bridge. So you can see that the old bridge and how they were built around the old bridge. Once the, you know, these parts, half of the back channel span, completed, then they were able to start cantilevering out the main span over the river. And then they were able to complete the main span. See, here's the main span here in completion. Once this was done, they took the, these parts, half of the uh, back, you know, each half of the back channel span, and they moved them to span the other channel. So to illustrate that, they, once this was completed, they moved the back channel spans in place, and then were able to complete. And here's what the bridge looks like today. So the next time you drive past on Carson Street or Ohio River Boulevard, think about how this part of the bridge, half of it was here and half of it was there during construction. In engineering, you design for both tension and compression. Bridge members are sized for tension and compression. But when you build a bridge as a cantilever, those forces are reversed. So all of these different bridge members had to be designed to be able to, to um, whole forces, withstand forces in both directions, both in uh, tension and in compression. It was a very innovative structure. Because of that, it became the largest bridge thus built with rigid connections. Last bridge I'll talk about today is the McKees Rocks Bridge, which planning began in 1914, but the War Department wanted a thousand foot span, which they thought would be too costly for this bridge. So it wasn't until the War Department relaxed span requirements to 750 feet that the bridge was able to be designed. So it was built from 1929 to 1931. See, just a few people showed up for the bridge opening. So I guess a little more exciting than today. But this bridge, 5,900 feet long. So the only bridge end to end that's over a mile long in this area, um, with a bunch of different designs to span um, this area from an arch over the main channel to deck trusses. This section is filled, and then these crescent arches. These crescent arch bridge, this is crescent arch design we have here, and you also have the County Belt Bridge in Keysport, um, the Jerome Street Bridge. These are really the only examples of this type of bridge in America. They're very common in Europe, but really it's just here that you have them. Meanwhile, this main span was built as a replica to Gustav Lindenthal's Hellgate Bridge, which was the largest bridge built with Carnegie Steel at the time. It's also built at the same time as the Sydney Harbor Bridge, and has the same design as the Sydney Harbor Bridge. And with that to conclude, I, I hope I demonstrated just how, how much care went into the design of the bridges themselves. The, in the city of Pittsburgh, a lot of designs were such for structural so rather than having simple cookie cutter bridges, Pittsburgh had very carefully designed bridges that might even be more challenging from an engineering perspective to get the look that the art commission wanted or the architects wanted. But look at today, look at how many different symbols of bridges are used to identify the city, whether it's the stadium series last night, where we have Fort Pitt Bridge around the rink, the West End or 16th Street Bridge is part of the logo. So the three, you know, one of the three sisters is the bicentennial logo. Just shows how much today how the city of Pittsburgh really 
is reflective of these carefully designed models. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, we more than happy to answer any questions. Also, we, I do have a few copies of the uh, Bridges book, if you're interested. Um, Helen and I would be more than happy to sign them, and it would be $20, which is $2 cheaper than the store price. With that, questions? I heard that the Smithfield Street Bridge is sitting on wooden foundation piers that still exist today, and that there's no other bridge like that with wooden piers. Is that um, I, mean, I, I, mean, I know that the, uh, you know, the Smithfield Street Bridge here, and the Smithfield Street Bridge is definitely older than the other bridges. I don't know for sure whether or not there are any other bridges or where any other bridges would be. Some of the piers could be handling the railroad bridge next to it. That bridge was originally built in the 1860s, and it's been modified. A lot of those piers have been removed, but it's possible that some of those piers might be still at least partially intact on the current bridge. So I so that I think it would be a reasonable conclusion that that bridge might be as well, but that I don't know. I had but certainly it's an interesting an acquaintance told me that it was like recently as the nineties there were still suspended scuba divers down to inspect these wooden foundations underneath that thing. That sounds right. I mean, that certainly, it certainly sounds reasonable. And then you certainly need uh, scuba divers to the bridge here. But the thing about the Smithfield Street Bridge is that there used to be a sandbar in the river right, right where the bridge is. Next year, he's talking about the type of support that you would need in a safety certain environment might be different if you can't go to that road. So, certainly an interesting point. Thank you. How many of you need to be replaced? Well, that's an excellent question. I would say how many need to be replaced? None. How many can be replaced? Um, you know, well, you can replace all of them. Yeah. Um, but need to be replaced? It's a question of, in, in terms of maintaining bridges, think of it as a question of maybe your automobile or your house. Come in. Couple of maintenance. It can last indefinitely. Once something starts to deteriorate, yeah. the longer it takes to fix it, the worse it gets, and the more expensive it gets. However, funding is quite an issue. You hear a lot of news about the need for infrastructure funding. When you don't have enough money, you can't make all of the necessary repairs right away, and then it becomes a bigger problem. So, and the repairs might get more costly that you might consider replacement rather than maintaining. In a perfect world, we go next if we maintain our structures well, they can last. If we go next time. Hmm? Yeah. Do you know how the freight in climbs over the elevated mountains or parks? Steam. They were steam as well. As, steam. as well as the inclines here. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. area of the decay incline here was the observation that that was the steam mm -hmm. And by the way, with the uh, with the incliners, uh, you know, there's a National Historic Site in Crescent, Pennsylvania, right off of Road 22, where they uh, um, tell the history of the Portage Railroad and excavated and reconstructed one of the uh, incliners. So if you have the opportunity, it's a little less than a two-hour drive, but it's just really fascinating. So the question is, if any of you didn't hear it, is why do we not have an opening or a movable bridge? Um, one of the reasons that we haven't is because Pittsburgh is hillier than other areas. So for the most part, there would be an area where you could tie into higher ground. They could consider Chicago or Cleveland, where there'd be areas where the ground wasn't that much that high above the riverbanks. So it would be very difficult to make a bridge of go up and back down. There you'd want the bridge to stay essentially ground level and you'd have a movable bridge to counteract the uh, low ground. Here in Pittsburgh, just about every bridge you can think of has at least one high side of the bridge. And um, in fact, some of the bridges in Pittsburgh to raise clearance were moved, meaning that, like for example, the 40th Street Bridge, 
the original bridge was at 40, 43rd Street, which went straight from Lawrenceville into Millbank, which was lower. When the bridges needed to be replaced for increased navigational clearances, instead of keeping the bridge there, they moved it to 40th Street so they could hide in the higher hillside, um, which is why when you cross the 40th Street Bridge today, you have a T intersection at the end of it. Um, so that's certainly part of it. Also, with the um, three sister bridges, when they tried to make those movable bridges that would lift, there was um, a lot of opposition to those ideas because they were, you know, the river interests were concerned if the bridge breaks, that would impede navigation. So the preference here was not to have movable bridges, and in most places they were able to get easily get away with not having a movable bridge. Well, well thank you.